I'm really grateful to have had the opportunity, right, to be able to play those different characters' perspectives. And that's one of the things that TTRPGs particularly do really well and really open up to people. He doesn't really want to go to war. He's not really a fighter. He likes to sit in his cave by the fire and read romance novels. I'm trans. And the voice is... It's the hardest part. They have this beautiful elven first name, and their last name's like Smith. It's like Galadriel Jones. friends, welcome to Characters Without Stories, a TTRPG podcast about the roads not yet traveled. I'm Star. This episode, I'm joined by Caroline Varenkamp, a suburban parent of two who does silly D&D character voices on TikTok from time to time. Caroline's podcast, Wonders of the World, is about all of the amazing places on Earth and the cultures that created them. Caroline, I'll give you a chance to plug your projects at the end. But right now, do you want to tell listeners a little bit about yourself? I started playing TTRPGs in the summer of 87 when I was 11 years old. And I was first introduced on a little vacation weekend with some friends to Basic D&D. Basic D&D was so basic that Elf was a class. <laughs> so I played that and I was like, oh, this is kind of fun. And then I um, met another kid that I was going to be in middle school with and... He introduced me to advanced D&D, where lo and behold, races and classes were different. And that got me in. And so then I started playing Middle Earth role playing, um, where I learned how to DM. And Torg, which is still one of my absolute favorites, because it's basically the Earth, like today's Earth, is invaded by alternate realities. And when you go into those alternate realities, like magic might go up or spiritual power might go up or technology might go down or might go up. And so you have these like crazy alternate worlds combining with earth. Like France was now the cyber papacy where (laughs) it was like the Avignon papacy had stayed and gone into the future and become cybernetic. So it's like the Terminator meets the Spanish Inquisition. (laughs) It was cool. And then the Nile Empire, like the Nile Valley, was the pharaohs back. So it was still very, it was like Egyptian mythology, but it was set in like the 1930s film noir. So it's superheroes, early comic books kind of thing meets the mummy. It was awesome. That sounds amazing. Yeah, so I played that and I, I loved DMing and I loved playing characters. And I loved doing these things. And then when I went to college, I had to do something cool. I had to be cool. I had to change my image, not be so nerdy. And so I put TTRPGs away and didn't play again until the pandemic. So wow. it was a really, really, really long time. What got you back into it? My kids. I have two kids, bored at home, right? Because the big school was closed. And we were all on lockdown. And I'm like, you know what might be fun to do? d d It's still around. Let's try it out. We got the essentials kit and they had a good time. And I just remember like suddenly like reconnected with the, oh my God, I love DMing. I love telling the story. I love playing all these characters, cheering them on when they do well, and then having vicious laughter when they don't. And, <laughs> you know, it's, it's so much fun. So it turns out they were up to like level 11. But they were so worried that their characters were going to die that they just stopped playing. Oh, no. And they didn't tell me. They didn't explain that was the problem. They just said, oh, well, we're all done. We got other things to do. We're not really interested. And I only learned that like two years later. (laughs) Like, oh, oh, okay. So, Caroline, who are you bringing to the table today? I seldom get to play as a player really seldom. And most of my character ideas that I have come from 
NPCs that I play in a campaign that I end up really liking. I'm like, I want to know more about this person. I want to like flesh them out more and make them so that they transfer into basically a PC, fully loaded, character sheet, big background, full stories for personalities. But I don't use them. <laughs> it's already done in the campaign. But then I'm like, well, I can always bring them to the next one. There never is a next one. <laughs> I try. So this character I'm bringing, it's actually a, it's kind of meaningful for me. I was taking a group of friends in person, like adults, <laughs> through Lost Minds of Fandelva, right? The beginning starter set adventure. And you know, the very beginning of that adventure, if you're familiar with D&D 5e starter set, you start with the goblin ambush. Goblins ambush the characters and often can kill them. So in this case, it was a really dicey thing. And they ended up, winning and killing all the goblins except one. We're going to keep him alive to ask questions. So on the spur of the moment, I had to like, oh crap, I hadn't really thought about like who these goblins are and what they sound like and what their deal is and like anything at all. And so I just defaulted into a Liverpudlian accent. So George the Goblin is a customs official and he simply stops passengers as they go through on the road to try to tell them what to do. He doesn't really want to go to war. He's not really a fighter. He likes to sit in his cave by the fire and read romance novels. It's just a more comfortable thing to do. He's more of a homebody than anything else. But, you know, when you work for the Goblin Kingdom, you have to do your chores and you have to, you know, serve in the armies. And so off he goes as a customs official. So he makes sure that, you know, all the deliveries are taken care of. You know, and if they happen to be taken care of away from the people who had them what before and took them somewhere else it was fine. Yeah. That's a bit of all right. So the idea of Judge, the, the customs official goblin, and I ended up bringing him back over and over again because it's just so challenging you know, you know, to we have this character who's so divided in his attempts on what he's going to do. It it's, becomes more of a challenge to figure out how does he adjust to actually having to kill, you know? How do you adjust to life in adventuring circles? We'd much rather be comfortable, you know, with a plush carpet. He's really more of a hobbit than a goblin, you know. <laughs> but that's all right. So that's George. George Sharptooth. Spur of the moment thing. And my players were just like, oh my God, we love George. We got to keep him around. And they nearly got him killed twice. And they dragged him along everywhere. And it was hilarious. But I think he'd be a really, really fun character to play in a campaign, right? Someone who is legitimately skilled, right? I mean, he's a rogue. He's a scout. Um, he's got pretty good abilities for being nimble and quick and sneaky, right? But he'd just much rather sit with a cup of tea, you know? Just sit. You know, if it came down to whether I'd want to go out and kill some dragons or sit at home with a cup of tea, I think I'm going to choose the tea. It's just more comfortable. It's an easier place to be. Was he then required to learn all of these rogue skills? Some of it comes out kind of naturally, right? Goblin, you know, nimble escape or whatever is one of those classic things. It's just so awesome. Leads naturally into rogueness. I know we're trying to like, you know, with, uh, with Monsters of the Multiverse or whatever, they're trying to separate out the idea that everyone of our race is particularly stereotypically X, but a lot of the physical traits they keep in. And right. so, you know, dark vision and being nimble and quick and fury of the small or whatever the goblin things are now all lead to a life of roguing. <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, from his standpoint, would he rather be on the front lines where things could get bloody, messy and deady? Or would you rather, you know, work in the in the customs department? And by customs, I mean raiding, right? Stealing things and running away. <laughs> I was going to ask, I'm like, what does a goblin customs department look like? Well, they're very official. They have badges. <laughs> and, uh, you know, require people to show their papers. And then they, you know, kill or incapacitate them and take all their stuff. <laughs> Taxes, right? Customs duties. Yeah, of course. It's just part of, you know, civilization. So the, in the campaign that I had built... The goblins and the goblinoids, because they were all kind of together, right, were 
craving the trappings of being included in civilization, right? And I got a lot of this from reading Volos, and I guess they say no more Volos, but hobgoblins in Volos are incredibly well-organized. They are incredibly lawful and focused, and they have libraries in every encampment and barracks, right? Every fort, hobgoblin fort's going to have a library. Now, yeah, it's mostly nonfiction stuff. Like, it's dude books, right? Like, history and geography. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Military tactics, lots of World War II stuff. Right. You know, a dude library. But I, I love this idea. It's like, wow, you know, they're really when you compare, actually, they're as, quote unquote, civilized as anybody. Right. Hobgoblins, when they conquer a place, they don't kill and maim, destroy and slay. They just simply say, OK, fine. You work for us. You send us taxes and we're fine. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's actually a pretty remarkably good thing to do. Do they allow dissent? No, they do not allow dissent. Are they pro-free speech? No, no, they are not. But they are also not like needlessly cruel. And I found this kind of concept fascinating. I was thinking, what if you had hobgoblins who weren't necessarily even like, evil, but just we want to be accepted as equals in a society that has favored humans, elves, dwarves, halflings. Right. We want to be part of that. And so they have these trappings, even though they are a very small group. This like little tribe I had were very small, but they had a king and a castle and ranks and all the trappings of civilization that they saw, right? The books that they had read said you have to have barons and you have to have jesters and you have to have like all these things they read in these feudal romance novels but they felt they <laughs> had to have all of those things so they could finally be recognized among the kingdoms of the earth and among those were customs duties taxation officials have to have them even though they are still doing what they had always done which is raiding taking things you know because they don't live in an area where they can they don't have like access to agriculture like they can't grow enough for themselves, so they have to take to survive. But um, I just thought it like a fascinating concept um, and sort of played up with that. Yeah. You said um, feudal romance novels. Do you mean like actual romance novels or, or novels that make feudalism romantic? Oh, in their case, gosh, both. <laughs> I would say both. Both those that are like, oh, you know, courtly love and the things that we have like but also yes yeah, steamy sex scenes nice yes george particularly enjoys those is it something where you know they raided and they had a library and they were like we want the romance novels or they were like we got the library let's look at what we have oh look at these these are what we're interested in more the latter or more well really more they would raid the places that raiding don't have libraries, they don't have books. The goblins are far better read than any of the human rural towns that are in their area. Like those places are just struggling mining towns and little farm hamlets. They're mostly all illiterate. They don't have anything. So the goblins are actually far more better read, <laughs> far more literate, far more capable. But they're like, all we have are military history books, so we need more. <laughs> So they would raid, they would take the money, and then they would send people to the cities to buy up uh, books. And they go to the cities and go to booksellers and things and just like, what do you have? <laughs> Whatever they didn't need for like survival purposes or investment in the community, they would go buy books to build up the library. And that's where the romance novels came from, because you're buying books, beggars can't be choosers, right? You're just saying, what do you got in the, you know, the one copper pile outside Barnes and Noble? Fantasy Barnes and Noble, of course. I love that they chose military strategy and geography and romance. Those are the things they gravitated towards. Well, that's just, you know, what else is there when you get right down to it? <laughs> are you personally a fan of romance novels? No. That gets into a lot of personal psychoanalysis. Yeah, we don't have to go there if you don't want to. I was just curious. I mean, ultimately, and where this is all going to go, and the reason, one of the reasons that characters are kind of hard, and in a way, playing TTRPGs is hard, is I'm trans. And the voice is, it's the hardest part, right? Undoing the damage 
the untold damage of testosterone is mm. it's almost impossible. Very few people can pull it off. I've only been able to do it with like this nasally pseudo California Midwestern accent that I have somehow given myself because that's the <laughs> only way I could like click it. But if you notice, when I go live Republican, it drops, right? Right. It just talks like this, and it's a much more natural baritone where my normal voice had been. Now, it's weird for me to talk about, like, now, if I try to go back to that, to my old voice, it's almost impossible. You've obviously made a choice to make this character male. Is that a difficult choice for you? It's hard. It's hard. And a lot of it is because I can't do accents and voices and modulations and things in the new voice i had to go back to the old voice to pull it off a lot of, like my orcs are almost always from west texas they got kind of a attitude about them we'll get militaristic community minded full hearts can't lose that kind of thing oh my god i love that and you know night watchmen always are cockney you know they, they can be like what's all this thing but i can't if I try to do a noble, get into English, and I can't really do a straight ahead, it ends up not being good, first of all. For some reason, I can do Liverpoolian better than any other English accent, but it's just really hard for me to do it in the feminine. And it becomes really hard, because even in characters that I'm not creating, right, even in NPCs as a general rule, I was having a really hard time because I can only gender swap the characters so much. Like, I can't expect the characters to think they're in a world without males interacting. But if I'm in a male voice too long from an NPC, I start getting misgendered by players, which is hard. Yeah, I can imagine. And that goes to romance novels, which is that there are almost no romance novels written would make me feel really uncomfortable because there's not, they're not written with a trans woman audience. So then it sounds like you made a couple of personally difficult choices when building this character. Yeah. Yeah. And that's part of the the challenge, too. It's funny because the joke is, you know, that everyone who plays d and d is queer in some way sort of happens. And being able to experiment. So I had, I'll, I'll, I'll tell a quick little story. The campaign I ran with the kids, the Essentials kids, I, Dragon of Ice Spire Peak is the module. The follow-ups of that have two primary big bad evil guys. One is like a high priest of a god of death who controls undead and raises an undead dragon, like a dracolich, to, to do evil things. And then the other one is a female half-orc barbarian slash cleric of a storm god. So she's trying to take over everything with this army of, you know, lightning fueled kind of barbarians in a way. So you get the idea. So as I was fleshing out these characters, and this was before I transitioned, I still thought I was a guy. I found that the cleric of death, I made really boring, like just really boring, middle-aged, paunchy, balding sort of the the kind of person that you feel obligated to invite to family gatherings, but you don't really want to talk to. He's in the background of all the family photos, but you don't really like him. And that's what drove him to hang out with the undead because they don't judge. Just incredibly boring. Kind of like talks like this. Did you hear about the incident at the swamp? It was... Very exciting. I mean, it's really terrible. Meanwhile, the half orc, I just went crazy with her. It's feral eye. Red hair that was always windswept, even if the air was still. Exciting, adventurous, always on the move, driven, constantly matching wits against the player characters, able to switch to like genteel and urbane if she needed to, and then able to like rough it with the guys if she needed to and she was just so tempestuous and so just vibrant right storm god cleric right you know tempest domain she's gonna be nuts and i found that as i was like doing this like wow she's so cool and this dude's such a boring prick like what's going on here it was like it was like a month later i'm like oh shit 
<laughs> oh, I have learned something about myself. So I'm really grateful to have had the opportunity, right, to be able to play those different characters' perspectives. And that's one of the things that TTRPGs particularly do really well and really open up to people. But it becomes an after-the-fact situation where you're like, you're revisiting and reopening old wounds that can be challenging. Yeah, I think it's interesting, uh, the act of inhabiting a character that's different from yourself can often give you the ability to kind of test the waters when exploring aspects of your personality and your identity. With George, you obviously gave them a very interesting quirk in that they love romance novels. And I think for me, sometimes the quirk is what really draws you into the character, what makes them the NPC that you bring along with you on the journey. Yeah. Is that something that you do when you're building a player character as well? Like kind of where do you start? Yeah, absolutely. I honestly, with player characters, I start with the quirk with a few, the very few that I've been able to build or I've been in a campaign. I start with the, what's an interesting thing I want to inhabit. I want to play. So I was in a campaign that I love the idea of somebody who was who like went to school because their parents said you have to go to school. This is your the expectation. Is you're going to go to university, you're going to be educated, you're going to get the degree. But somebody who just they're not meant for that. Really not like intellectually gifted and in some DD terms it means like a low intelligence score basically, but super charismatic and ended up gravitating into library science because they could pretend to be smart to please their parents, but they always had books so they could rely on for the information. They'd have to do the thinking for themselves. They could just research. So they weren't good at putting two and two together. They were good at knowing this book says what's up. Then the backstory, basically, they found a genie ring and became a warlock. <laughs> and suddenly they're like, oh, check it out. I'm a super powerful wizard because I'm so smart. And they're faking the whole thing. <laughs> and I love the idea that they carry the books around. They know about books, right? But they're dumb as a brick. You know, she was, she was a half drow. Her parents were both adventurers. I love half elves because I love giving them the, the worst names. <laughs> <laughs> because I love the idea of like, they have this beautiful elven first name and their last name is like Smith. It's like Galadriel Jones. <laughs> because that's totally how it works, right? I mean, they like, the ones that live, grow up in human societies generally have these beautiful elven first names. And the ones that grow up in elven societies generally have these like human first names. That's canon. And Smith is totally a legitimate name in any fantasy setting because it just means your father was a smith. Your family of blacksmiths, totally legitimate name. So her name was Valantha Smith. <laughs> she's this beautiful half drow that everyone thinks is like a super powerful wizard. But no, and she's a warlock with a genie in her ring. I love that. Sorry, I keep going back to the romance novels, but again, it's that quirk that really like pulled me in. I think it's interesting because romance novels are something we usually associate with femininity. And obviously that's not really the case, but we, we think of romance novels as something that women read, that men don't yeah. read. And that, that's fair. Was that part of that choice for you? That kind of going against a stereotype? Not consciously. Mm. It was just, I was trying to think of, again, that the quirk that make George unique, not just that he was really trying to legally justify the crimes he was committing, but also I just like the idea of like, okay, you know, he, he'd much rather not be here in the cold and rain. He'd rather be someplace cozy with a fire going, some meat grilling, you know, roasting in the oven and, and reading a book. And I thought, what would he read? And somehow the idea of a romance novel with a doomed love between an elf man and a dwarf woman sounded really appealing. Again, it was in the library because somebody got it at the bargain bin because it's just trash. <laughs> There's no literary value. But for him, it's just it's this world that he can't get to and sort of an opening into understanding this world around that he was limited and in, in, in reaching. I mean, I guess it could have been it could have been any number of things he was reading, but I just love the idea of doomed romance, trashy, you know, bodice ripper on the cover. <laughs> 
It's interesting that you bring that up as a way of exploring other cultures as well. Yeah, you know, maybe there probably aren't a lot of goblinoid romances. I mean, there could be depending on your setting, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But kind of in the way that you were talking about your world is that goblins were kind of set apart. Being able to read about a culture that you're not a part of is an interesting way to approach it, even though it's not history of the world. It sounds like they were also reading those kind of histories too. That's also my own experience. So I was a French cultural studies major. My degree is in French cultural studies. So I read all these classics of French literature in the original Francais. And I learned more about real culture, just reading trashy Belgian graphic novels. Because you just got a, a more real world view of what people are like and what they do and how they think and how they act. Then you get if you read L'Etranger, you know. I mean, L'Etranger is amazing. The Stranger, it's amazing. But Oh, yeah, I love that book. But being able to inhabit kind of an everyday person, you know, almost like we inhabit characters, but being able to hear from a character's interior their what they're feeling and thinking as well. Yeah. In a couple ways, George is kind of going against stereotypes. And when you're talking about your other character as well, your, your half drow character, is they're kind of at odds with an aspect of their personality. You have yeah. an elf who is expected to be a wizard who is instead a warlock and kind of pretending to be something else. Is that kind of an approach that you tend to take? Uh, now we're getting into therapy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the whole the whole idea of like pretending to be something that you're not and not being able to really in, be who you are. Yeah, no, that's that's a theme consistently <laughs> in my entire life. And yeah, it took just 44 years to figure it out. But yeah, yeah. Is it something that's that's conscious or subconscious for you? It was subconscious forever. Now it's more conscious. I was in a band, right? And I wrote songs. You know, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, originally. They give you the guitar when you come out of the womb. <laughs> we got on the radio we played gigs it was it was cool and looking back at lyrics things that i wrote when i was 20 23 you know 18 16 that range when you're you're miserable and grungy and angst ridden and you write a bunch of song lyrics and honestly half of them were about wanting to be a girl <laughs> and i did not even think about it it did not click in my head at all because it's all veiled and it's all metaphor and it's all just Oh, it's written from somebody else's perspective. It inhabits pretty much everything I, I do now, too, is that there's always something underneath the surface and there's always these sort of playing against type. I'm about the same age as you, I think maybe only a couple years younger. And I think for people around our age growing up, gender identity was a lot less fluid. It wasn't something that we had as much access to in terms of having role models to look at or people who were None. transitioning. Yeah. None. I mean, I knew when I was six, but I didn't have the vocabulary. I didn't really understand that it was even something somebody could do. I didn't have, there were no, there were no role models. My best friend growing up, we were in Boy Scouts together. We were altar boys together. He's gay. I went to his gay wedding over the summer. You're over two there, St. Phillips. <laughs> <laughs> he always talked about how the real and grace didn't exist when we were young. There was just no visibility. And that was sexuality from a, a gender identity perspective. It was punchlines and jokes. My daughter's been watching The Simpsons and every episode for like a 10 year, 15 year period has a joke about trans people. Every single episode. And it is your know, punchline. And so Lord knows you don't want to admit that. You wouldn't dare. I didn't dare. And then eventually I'm like, well, I guess I'm stuck as this. So. I'll accept that. It's never too late to discover who you are and to live that. And I love that. 100% true. So going back to George, their adventuring story starts when they meet the party and get kind of dragged along. In that case, yeah. But I would love to bring George back for a campaign where he's like meeting a bunch of people in the tavern. I, George could fit anywhere as long as there's a cozy place he can yearn for. <laughs> Otherwise, he's sort of like, he feels duty bound to like shuffle along. We're going to go fight the dragon. He's like, oh, Ross, I guess we'll go fight the dragon. But I don't really want to fight the dragon. Can't we just have a cup of tea? Fine. I mean, he feels this obligation. Okay, I'll come along. But he's going to grumble a lot about it. The reluctant adventurer trope. Yeah, it's probably overplayed, but 
No, I, I, to me, I think what's interesting about that approach is then you have to find a way to justify why they keep adventuring and what they kind of discover about themselves or about that life that they enjoy. Whether that's getting the power to do something to accomplish a task or whether it's just finding yourself or finding an affinity for it. In George's case, it was it loyalty to the new friend friends. You know, just like he felt loyalty to his country and loyalty to the king and loyalty to like do his job. He's fiercely loyal to people, especially if they show that back. If there's kindness and friendship and all these things that he reads in these books, does he ever think he'll find love himself? Well, maybe. But in the meantime, he'll settle for friendship and he's fiercely loyal to his friends. If George was going to have a motto to live by, what do you think that might be? Do we have to go in there? (laughs) I love that. Wouldn't it be easier just to wait for them to come out? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, that's good. Then the monsters won't get their lair actions. You can wait in ambush. You shoot your, your, your arrows. You, you hide. Shoot again. I mean, super lethal. He's super lethal. Because again, he was obligated to do that. But yeah, he'd rather just not get messy. He sees the monster killing or the death he has to deal as an obligation then to the other party members. Yeah. He's really simple. Like, he's not driven by a desire for wealth or power. He really likes a simple life and can be very comfortable just living simply. As long as he has books and a fire and some tea, he's fine. But if he's loyal to a group of friends and his group of friends are like, hey, this is important to us, then it'll be important to him. And so it's that, that fierce loyalty that kind of drives him more than anything else. Like, he's not driven by a sense to do good. He's not driven by a feeling that he owes it to the world to help the disadvantaged or anything like that. It sounds nice, but it doesn't really move him. But it's the loyalty to the friends that does, which is both good and bad, right? Because it means that if he's in a party of good people, paladins and doers of good, then he'll jump right in and do good. But if it's a party that is of murder hobos, he'll he'll murder hobo along with it just out of loyalty. You know, for me, I really struggle with playing a character that doesn't do good, that is comfortable doing the morally wrong thing. How is that for you? You're a DM first and foremost, and so you're going to have to play evil characters. I mean, the thing is, there are very few, very, very few rational thinking creatures or characters do evil just to do evil, right? There's almost always a rationale. There's almost always something that they're working towards, right? Whether it's riches, power, praise from others. They just really want people to bow down before them. Just they get off on that. Awesome, right? And those can be evil goals, but I mean, there's a goal. There's a reason, there's something driving them to make the decisions they make. And then they're just willing to accept that the ends justify the means. So even if it means things happening that perhaps they would not do in a vacuum, they will do it because it helps them achieve that goal of whatever that goal might be. And in some cases, you know, like, so my kids watch this French cartoon show called Miraculous. It's like Ladybug and Cat Noir, superheroes in France. It's pretty good. So the bad guy there is super, 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 super evil. But he's evil... Because he's trying to get the power to bring his wife back to life. Because his wife died far too early young, and he's trying to bring her back. And to do that, he needs these things that the heroes have. So he's trying to get them from the heroes. But it ends up driving him insane because he keeps failing. <laughs> because it's a kid's cartoon show, right? And it just, he gets more and more megalomaniacal, more and more driven to evil for evil's sake even though he had this goal in mind, the goal starts becoming less and less meaningful to him. So it's, those sorts of things happen when playing characters like that. So in George's case, I mean, he's just a really true neutral guy. And I find neutral alignments to be easily the hardest alignments to play. I know we're not supposed to be into alignment anymore. Alignment's supposed to be out. But I do think it's helpful to kind of serve as a guidepost for behavior. And, you know, traditionally, there's this notion of neutrality as 
separating from the world, right? Being Switzerland, we're not going to pass judgment on anybody. We're not going to get involved. And in old D&D, druids had to be true neutral, and they couldn't be associated with doing good or doing evil, following the rules or being chaotic. But I think someone like George is a much better example of true neutral, like someone who really could go any way depending upon the people around him. And I know that sounds like it's, oh, well, he's really succumbing to peer pressure, but it's not that simple. It is, you are meaningful to me, and so your goals are meaningful to me. And those goals and how you choose to achieve them may be good, maybe evil, maybe lawful, maybe chaotic. I'm going to follow along. Just understand that when push comes to shove, I'll be there but I'll be wishing I were at home. George, can you tell when someone is flirting with you? <laughs> no, <laughs> not even a little bit. Mainly because I don't think anyone does. And I'm three and a half feet tall, kind of bad teeth. Nobody wants to talk to me. But it would be nice if they did. I don't know. I guess it's possible somebody was flirting with me. I'm trying to think back. There was that gnome. But I think he just really wanted to, like, you know, sell me decorative gourds. Because, you know, he was a decorative gourd salesman. I said I didn't want any because, you know, I don't really have room and I wasn't really hosting any events. But he was like, no, you've got to have the decorative gourds. Oh, no. So sort of acky dacky. <laughs> Such a git. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I hadn't really thought about it. Does does not really seldom come up? That was a whole journey, that answer from, I don't know, to somebody's trying to sell me decorative gourds. I love that. That's a very DM answer, I think, to me, is letting that take you somewhere. Ah, uh, sort of happens. Stream of consciousness, Judge. It just sort of keeps going. Caroline, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing Judge with us. I had so much fun. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So how can people find you? What kind of projects do you want to share? In this world, the easiest thing is to find me on TikTok. I'm on TikTok all the time. I, had, I did a George voice and it went, that was like my one big viral moment. <laughs> and all these people followed me and they're like disappointed that I'm not constantly doing voices. If you do like history, travel and food, Wonders of the World, I've been doing it for six years. I am currently on an unofficial hiatus mainly because I just cannot get the energy together to edit three hours of interviews that I had for my next episode. It's so daunting. That's a lot. Machu Picchu is the next episode. So basically, Wonders of the World, I'm looking at world history through the lens of the great places on Earth. It is, you know, 60% history, 30% travel, 10% food. Because you got to eat. <laughs> It's hard to talk about food on a podcast, too. I know. Well, I give recipes. I know. I, I listened to the one about, uh, I think it was Mansa Musa. That would have been the Timbuktu episode. It's like a peanut stew. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, That's it. So yeah. good. You would not think <laughs> that fish sauce would fit, but it is amazing. So, so good. You can find me on TikTok as well at S-T-A-R-M-A-M-A-C. That's Star Mama C. You can also listen on YouTube. Just search for Characters Without Stories. Please like, subscribe, rate, review, share with your friends, share with your mom. Every little bit helps. I'm currently accepting submissions, particularly for non-D&D characters. So if you'd like to share your character, you can go to the submission form at characterswithoutstories.com. Thanks for listening, and may all of your characters find their stories.